Hi. It's great to see I'm you. In, How are I'm you? I'm in the camera. I can't oh, see. Oh, sc excuse me. Uh, hi. Nice to see hi. you. How are you? Nice to see you. It's been a, it's been a while. Awesome. All right, Alex. Uh, Annie, thank you for doing this. I'm excited, uh, Xers, to be talking about this. I think that this issues that Annie has looked at and written around, written about on sort of thinking in probabilities, gathering evidence, um, forming hypotheses and testing them is super aligned with a lot of how we think here. I think I appreciate the Women of X sponsoring this. And I think this is a particularly great way to sort of like build some of the diversity of thought that we're interested in in X. So thank you for doing this with us, Annie. It's wonderful to see you and uh, take it away, Alex and Annie. Thank you, Astro, and thank you, Annie, again for joining us today. We're I'm very excited to talk to you, and I know everyone here is really excited to hear from you. Um, so for those of you who don't know Annie, um, she is a World Series poker player, um, extremely accomplished author, and now teaches over at Wharton. Um, and I heard recently completed her PhD and is doing some other amazing work in the last um, few years since we last spoke to her. So for those of you who haven't caught it, Annie actually spoke with Astro here a few years ago. So I'll put that recording out for those that, that missed that talk. Um, and since the time that Annie came back, she's actually released her most recent book, Quit, The Power of Walking Away, um, which there's a few copies out for distribution. So grab yourself one. Um, and Annie, you have had a fantastic journey as a World Series poker champion to becoming an author and a lecturer um, and a consultant on decision making. What was the pivotal moment that inspired that career transition for you? Oh gosh. Uh, you know what one of the things that one of the things that I talk about in the recent book quit is the lessons that we can learn from forced quitting. So um, we need about quitting, like if I quit my job, I'm quitting, but also if if my employer fires me, they're quitting, they're quitting me mm -hmm. from their perspective, but then I'm being forced to quit from my perspective. Yeah. yeah. So um, so what happens is that once we start things, there's a lot of there's so many cognitive biases that kind of like pile up on top of us to make it really hard for us to stop things. And that's really bad because a lot of times you learn things after the fact that tell you you shouldn't keep doing the thing that you're doing. Um, and you kind of stop exploring other options. You don't really think, we're not good at thinking about the opportunity costs of other things that we could be doing. And when we're forced to quit, um, it's a moment where, uh, you know, as bad as it feels, and, and it's not that it turns out well every single time, obviously, but it does force you into an exploratory mode. It starts making you think about, well, what are the op other opportunities that I've been foregoing because I've been pursuing this other thing? And that happened to me very early on in my adult life. So I, uh, right out of college, I went to UPenn for graduate school uh, to study cognitive psychology. I was there for five years. And uh, in my last year, I was on the job market. I had lots of job talks lined up. Uh, I was on the, my way to the first one. And I had been struggling uh, for quite a while with a sort of chronic stomach illness that became quite acute. And uh, I was unable to go to the job talks. I actually ended up in the hospital for a couple of weeks. And it became clear that I, I needed to take time off. So this is a forced quitting event for me. So I'm, you know, in the academic route in graduate school for five years on my way to go give my job talks because I'm going to go get an assistant professor position. And, uh, you know, life got in the way, my health got in the way and said, nope, you have to take some time off. And once that happened, I, I didn't have my fellowship. I was there on a National Science Foundation fellowship. So that money went away. Uh, I grew up in a household where my dad was a school teacher. My mom didn't work. So I didn't really have the option to just hang out and I needed to make money. And I started exploring ways that I could make money that would fit in with some constraints that I have, like, you know, I'm gonna go back to graduate school. I'm gonna go back out on the job market. Um, and poker kind of fit the bill. 
as you know flexible hours i if i didn't feel well i didn't have to work that day um it seemed like a good way to make money whatever um and i did that and obviously that particular career path at the time worked out really well for me but i think that at that having happened to me in my 20s it made the idea of quitting not so scary to me anymore um that there's always other things you could be doing and and what you're choosing to focus on uh, might be great, but it's also taking focus or attention or time or whatever away from other things that you could be doing. Um, and I started being much more willing to engage in other opportunities, sometimes in parallel. And sometimes I would figure out that the thing that I was trying out, I liked better and I would ditch the other thing. So uh, I retired from poker in 2012 because I was getting more joy from other things that I was doing. And I really trace it back to that er very early lesson of something that felt so horrible and disastrous and derailing my life and all of these things at the time that turned out to open my eyes to the fact that that you could actually view that as an opportunity. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and actually, the first thing that crosses my mind is how how did you go from like I'm I'm heavy in my academic study for cognitive science to poker? <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's a very was, good question what was that jump like okay so first of all let me just set the table for a second uh this is in the 90s so there is no internet poker and poker is not on television so poker is quite ubiquitous on television starting in 2002 um it's everywhere but this is before that happened <laughs> so it's even more unusual than you think so I was lucky enough to have a brother who, I guess at the time you might've called a degenerate. I mean, he wasn't, I'm, I'm saying that lovingly. So my brother, when he was in high school, uh, got really uh, enamored with chess. He actually became a master. Um, and he would, you know, go and play in chess tournaments and he was studying, you know, big, huge volumes of chess openings and things like that. Um, and he, got into Columbia and then deferred a year because he wanted to study with a grandmaster because he was he loved chess. He really he his goal at that time was to become a grandmaster when he was 18. So he goes off to New York, he defers Columbia for a year. He's playing chess and the games worlds in New York are quite intertwined. This is in the uh 80s, the very early 80s. They're quite intertwined. And it turns out that if you go to places where there are chess, there's chess, there's also like backgammon and poker. So he starts playing poker and he had a small, a modest college fund and he immediately lost all of it because he was very bad at poker. Um, but he, um, he, you know, I think he really, like we always played a lot of games when we were growing up. And so I, I think he really liked the game and he found a couple of kind of, at the time, obscure poker books. They're not so obscure now, but, the time they were and he started reading them um and he started thinking much more strategically about the game and he ended up doing really well so he never really did i think he maybe went to college for six months or something but by the time 1983 rolled around he had already been he was the youngest person to have ever made the world series of poker final table main event not anymore at the time he was 23 now 21 year olds have done it but um so he was very good so the whole time i'm in college i went to college in new york i i went to columbia actually also and um I used to go and like watch him play. I would like sit behind him and watch him play. And uh, so I knew, you know, quite a bit about the game just from watching the game. So when it turned out I needed to take time off, I moved to Montana with my then husband um, because he had a house there. And, you know, I'm just going to take a year off and like relax in Montana, I guess. But I was like, oh, no, we need money. Uh, and my brother suggested, he said, you know, I th there is, there's poker in Montana. Why don't you play? Um, and I was like, yeah, sure, this was now in the 90s. And um, I was like, all right, I'll give it a try. And I remember I, I have a book that has like, I uh, wrote down like my PL. And the first month I made $2,300. And you need to understand that the professor positions that I was applying to paid $23,000 a year. So that $2,300 seemed like a whole lot. I was like, what would I ever do with all this money? <laughs> I'll never be able to spend this. Um, and so that's how that happened is that my degenerate brother who was responsible for anything that I did that was ever maybe, you know, 
skirting like what you would want your child to do also was the one who made me play poker, which turned out to be a good thing. Ah, okay. So then did you find that your, um, I guess, research in cognitive science made you, I guess, a combination of having watched your brother for so many years and also your experience of like studying cognitive science, did you find that you accelerated through the poker world quickly? Uh, I know so, also being a woman in poker was really unique at the time too. It's actually but, still quite unique. Still now. <laughs> it was unique uh, in some ways good, some ways bad. Um, uh, it was unique in the sense that uh, there's a lot of stereotypes that people have that the men who were playing poker had and um, they're very sticky and mostly they amount to some combination of I would like to I'll use the nice word I'd like to date you um, I, I don't respect your intellect in any way shape or form um, and uh, I want to uh, dominate you in some way um, all three of those things are good if you're trying to play poker for the person who's for me, right? Because it means that they're going to not play the way uh, they play against other people against me. And this is not, I want to be very clear, in no way, shape, or form is this 100% of men who treated me this way. I have many very good friends who are male poker players. It's just like there's just sort of like in general, like a lot of the people playing poker kind of come in with these very big stereotypes towards you. Um, that was the good stuff. The bad stuff was there was no HR department. Yeah. Uh, and so there, I mean, it was, there were, it, you had to have a very, very, very thick skin. Uh, it, there was, this was way before Me Too. This was way before nobody would dare say certain words to a woman, way before that. Um, and that was on a daily basis Yeah. to me. So, um, so, you know, so it was like, so yes, I was, a, but but I advanced very quickly. I think that that was also part of the reason why they said such mean things to me because I was taking their money right away. As I said, my first my <laughs> first um, my first month I made it was actually twenty eight hundred dollars. Now that I think about it, my first month it was twenty eight hundred dollars, and then I just kind of went from there. And by the first time I played in the World Series of Poker, I cashed in four events. I made it to the final three tables of the World Series of Poker. I made a final uh, table. So the question is like, why? Right. And um, I think, you know, certainly I had incredible mentors. So as I said, my brother lost his college fund before he became very successful. So I got to not lose my college fund before I learned what he learned. Right. So he there was a lot of knowledge transfer occurring. But the other thing is that I, I think that the work that I'd done in cognitive science, you know, much of which was really familiarizing myself with um, issues of decision making and, and, and learning under uncertainty was incredibly helpful for me because a lot of the things that we that I studied in graduate school are just like front and center out loud at the poker table. So it's this lab where you get to see these things that you studied like in theory, in practice, under high stakes conditions. And so I, I could identify those things, I think, and think about them and then understand like how would I give myself structures and and kind of rules and policies that will allow me to overcome a, a lot of the problems that I'm seeing at the table and from from other players and, and myself as well. And I would put those into sort of two categories that actually can be put under an umbrella, but one is a failure to quit and the other is, but they go hand in hand, is um, risk seeking. Risk -seeking. Uh, the reason why they go hand to hand, hand is if that you if you don't quit you're being risky mm. if that yeah. makes sense uh but there's a little bit of a difference because it has to do with like increasing your risk um and so uh, and then sometimes you got the opposites where someone decreased their risk because they were so afraid of ever losing and so you sort of see these risk attitudes problems happening that i knew about from my uh, schooling and then also the, the sort of failure to to walk away problems um, both of which I tried to put a lot of structure around in order to address them. And I think that certainly helped me to be more successful. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and actually with um, the, 
you know, with all of that, you kind of, you, you touched on a few things that I would almost call like kill criteria of, and also this thinking in bets and as you said, kind of having the structure around yourself of knowing kind of what the, the human inclination is for some of those situations. Yeah. The, what do you think are the sort of main struggles that a lot of folks have in sort of these decision-making, whether high risk or low risk? Yeah, so we can think about the, the broad problem that we have as decision makers. Um, and I can relate it to poker, but it's any decision you make. Yeah. Uh, the first is that when you make a decision, uh, how that turns out is going to be influenced by luck. So um, I can think about playing a poker hand against you where say I have aces and you have two fives um, and I'm going to win that hand 81 and a half percent of the time. Right? So it's clearly like a good decision for me to play this hand against you. But if I'm going to win 81 and a half percent of the time, what it means is that, um, you know, obviously 18 and a half percent of the time I'm going to lose. And when I observe that 18 and a half percent, I have no control over because that has to do with like a random deal of the cards, right? Like if a five hits, you're gonna, you'll have three of a kind and I'll just have two aces and I lose. Um, uh, you know, if, um, if I uh, am using ways and, and I take a particular route on a road, um, while I'm on the road in between exits, an accident could happen at some point in front of me and all of a sudden I'm just stuck. Right. And that's going to happen some percentage of the time. But I just I have literally no control over that. So like people say, you know, you hear this phrase a lot where people say I make my own luck. Um, and it's actually a phrase that makes literally no sense because you you <laughs> luck is something you have no control over. I, what people actually mean is I make decisions that lower the chances that I have a bad outcome. Mm. Right. But the influence of luck is the same no matter what. Right. Like literally it's it doesn't change it's just that you've you've adjusted the set of outcomes that are available to you that luck could have an influence over in terms of which one you actually observe okay so that that's kind of problem number one is decision makers problem number two is decision makers is that when we make a decision we don't have all the facts um we know very little in comparison to all there is to be known um and so uh so we're making decisions the way that i would put it like is we're not omniscient we don't have a time machine so that's hard um, okay, so this is, if we take that as a problem, this is where all of our problems as decision makers stem from. Uh, and it stems from that on both the starting, do we choose to do something, right? And the stopping. So let's start with, do we choose to do something? This is where you get um, these weird risk attitudes um, changes. So uh, one of the things that you see is that people are afraid to start things because they're afraid that they won't work out. Mm. And because we don't have a time machine. People um, won't start things until they've built a case beyond the point at which it was already correct to start. Um, so uh, you'll see people, for example, like here's a very simple example. It's kind of trite, but also deep at the same time. Um, I'm ordering. I, I go to a restaurant. I see stuff on the menu. And I ask everybody at the table what they're ordering. I ask them the, what they think about what I'm thinking about. I tell them I'm having a hard time with it. The wait staff comes over and I'm saying to them, what would you order <laughs> if you were me? Right. And it's like 15 minutes later, I'm just like having this agonizing situation over what to order. Like, why is that happening to me? Why am I doing that? Because I'm afraid that I'm going to get my food and it's going to be yucky and I'm going to feel like I made a mistake. So I'm, I'm doing decision work well beyond the point at which I should be, right? Because I'm afraid I'm going to get a bad outcome and feel bad, feel like I, I made an error. So what I want to be able to say is, what could I do? I got consensus. I got information from everybody. Uh, you know, everybody agreed with me. Or I look at this. I have a 200-page brief on why it was correct for me to order the chicken. Um, so. So I think that, you know, we're just very uncomfortable with uncertainty on the start because we know that at minimum we're going to observe the outcome. And if the outcome doesn't go our way, we're going to feel bad. And uh, most of the time we're also going to like learn new information. So that makes it hard for us to start things. It slows us down on the start. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that we don't stop things enough. 
Because the solution to that first problem, how do you speed up your decision making? How, do, how are you willing to make more decisions under extreme uncertainty? It's going to make you be more innovative. It's going to make you move faster, all these things. Well, how do we actually allow ourselves to do that? Well, because when we find out new information, whether it's just observing that the outcome isn't going our way, like, oh, no, the dealer Delta five or I learn new information. Right. You act in a certain way that tells me more stuff about the cards that you're holding that I was previously guessing at because they're hidden from me. Um, then we can change our minds. But the problem is we don't do it. Yeah. Because that decision is also made under uncertainty. The time that it's right to quit is before you're certain that you should quit. Because by the time you're certain that you should quit, it's no longer a choice anymore. You're out of money. You're, you've fallen into the crevasse already, right? Like the hand is over. Like all that. So, so the time to quit is much earlier than that. And we're just really bad at it because we're afraid of like, but what if it had worked out? Like, you know, what if the new thing that I try doesn't work out either? You know, there's all these things that happen. And so we can kind of divide the world into those problems, both of which you see in decision making and at the table. Yeah. You touched on so many things there. I know. Sorry. No, that's great. It's great, actually. Once you it, wind me up. <laughs> it ties into all of my questions. Um, one of the things that you mentioned in your book that I really... Um, had a big shift for me was uh, this term resulting. Um, and specifically, you brought up the example of Pete Carroll with the Super Bowl. Yep. Um, could you, for the uninitiated, could you explain what resulting is? Yep. So when you're deciding between the chicken and the fish and you order the chicken and it turns out yucky and you say, oh, I made a mistake, that's resulting. Um, so it's essentially just tying the quality of the outcome back to the quality of the decision. When actually those two things are correlated, but only correlated uh, and somewhat loosely so, depending on how much luck there is in the equation. Um, so how we actually figure out decision quality is not based on one particular outcome that we might observe. You would have to have a large enough data set in order to reach statistical significance to say something, to say that the outcome is determinative of the quality of the decision and it's not. So the, the, the particular instance that you're referring to that, um, is throughout the my my first general audience book thinking about is you know Pete Carroll in the Super Bowl in 2015 he's uh his team the Seahawks is um playing the New England Patriots they're on the one yard line they're down by four there's 26 seconds left in the whole game and it's second down so uh in this particular situation there's an accepted play which is to hand the ball off to the running back and try to, you know, or do a quarterback sneak something, but to try to plow through the defense. But Pete Carroll actually does something, I'd say innovative, uh, because it's unexpected. It's not something that most people would do here. And he calls for a pass play. So uh, the ball is passed, Russell Wilson, the, uh, the quarterback passes the ball, it's intercepted by Malcolm Butler and the game is over and everybody freaks out. Um, and the headlines are, that's the wor mostly the worst play in Super Bowl history. Um, I think it was USA Today called it the worst play in NFL history, which is pretty strong. Um, okay, so this is a really good example of resulting, right? Because we don't have any data on the play itself. All we know is it didn't go well. And it's very easy for us to, to do the thought experiment really quickly, which is, well, what if it had been caught for the game-winning touchdown? would the headlines have been the same? And it's like, no, obviously not. The headlines would not have been the same in any way. It would have been, what a brilliant call. He's going to the Hall of Fame. He out Belichick, Belichick. He's a genius. Best play call in Super Bowl history. All right, so we know that there's a problem here, right? Which is that we're not actually thinking about the quality of the decision. We're just substituting in the quality of the outcome for the quality of the decision. Now, obviously, that's bad. Because when we're trying to close those feedback loops, um, that's what's going to inform our future decisions, the future decisions that we make. Um, just really quickly, uh, an amazing decision. Um, 26 seconds left with only one timeout is a problem on second down because uh, you want to be able to run a play on second, third, and fourth down, three downs. And um, pretty hard to do that when you have 26 seconds left and only one play. 
Uh, but there is one way to do that, which is to call a pass, pass play in one of the first two downs. And the reason is that when you run the ball and you don't score, the clock keeps running. But when you pass the ball and you don't score in the normal way, which would be an incomplete pass, the clock stops on its own and it acts like a timeout. So if you run a pass play, um, then you, you can get three downs instead of two, which I think everybody would like against the New England Patriots. Um, the cost of the play is the interception rate. Oh, and also, by the way, they'll score 50% of the time giving it to the running back. But it, the, the simple thing is the, the cost of buying that, the cost of buying a third down is the interception rate, which is less than 1%. So it's actually like one of the most brilliant plays in Super Bowl history, but nobody wants to do it now mm. because of resulting. And that's the problem is he did something very out of the box that was incredibly smart and got soundly criticized for it uh, in a way that would make people not want to make that decision going forward. Yeah. No, I really, um, I, I love this idea of separating a good and bad decision from independent from a good and bad outcome. Because I think right. it puts a lot of, empowerment in people to okay what is what is the information i have right now what are the resources i have right now what's the best decision i can stand by right now independent of how the outcome turns out um, which i think in some ways you know and you brought up kind of this the what if question what if i had done this and yeah it i think helps us do that foresight and hindsight back and forth a little bit better of okay well you know this is where I am now. What can I do? Um, the what do you think is sort of like it's independent from resulting? Because um, I know in your new book you talk a lot about quitting um, mm -hmm. and sort of the the unique struggles there. Um, and I was I was pleased to see that uh, X made an appearance in your in your most recent book. So that was great. Um, what? Well, in general, what do you think are the sort of the biggest obstacles to people quitting on time? And I know that that has its own. Yeah. Meaning. Okay. Oh, my gosh. All right. <laughs> let me think about this. Because um, there's a lot. Well, uh, let, let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm to give two things, uh, three, yeah. three quick bullets. So let me relate it back to what I just said about Pete Carroll. So I'll do the thought experiment. Um, with you, actually. Um, imagine that Pete Carroll had handed the ball off to Marshawn Lynch like everybody wanted him to. So he does the play that everybody's expecting, which is to run the ball. And let's imagine that Marshawn Lynch doesn't score. And then you go to the next down and he hands the ball off to Marshawn Lynch, which is what everybody's going to want him to do. And Marshawn Lynch doesn't score again how do the headlines change the next day? Well, I guess probably maybe instead of being the worst play in history, still that it was a poorly played game. Um, well, maybe, I mean, they got pretty close against the Patriots. Do you think they would have talked about, do you think they would have called Pete Carroll an idiot and said that it was the worst play call? Or do you think they would have praised the Patriots defense? Oh, that's a good point. Um, Probably a mix of both, but yeah, I mean, praising the Patriots defense. Um, well, but, you know, actually, I think generally people jump to criticism more quickly than they do praise. Yeah, um, a little. I mean, I think that what would have happened is I don't think there would have been a single. Let's put it this way. There would be no headline that said it was the worst play call in Super Bowl history. There wouldn't have been anything that said Pete Carroll is an idiot. There would have been, because there was actually a headline that said that. Nobody would have said it was the worst play call in NFL history. I think that what would have happened, it would would have been uh, Seahawks failed to take advantage in the last 26 seconds of the game as the Patriots defense holds. I would argue that Pete Carroll's name would not be mentioned. Hmm. Right, it would be like the defense held; they didn't convert. Marshawn Lynch couldn't convert, you know, something like that. But nobody's going to say like, why on earth did Pete Carroll run the ball? All right, so 
what does this have to do with quitting? <laughs> okay. so I'm, I'm going to bring it back to that. Um, so I just want to set that up. So, so what we can see is there's a difference in the reaction that people have to doing something that's status quo and doing something that is changing the status quo. So the status quo is handed off to Marsha and Lynch. The innovative, the, the change would be to pass the ball. And you can have an equally bad outcome. You lose the Super Bowl. It's the same outcome, right? But the way that people process that is very different. Nobody's, when I put a picture up of this play, the whole audience starts talking. I mean, this is now, we're eight years later. Everybody knows it. Mm. Nobody would know what it was. They'd be like, what is that? What's that situation that's happening there? Okay, so let's think about how this is one of the biggest impediments to quitting is that the status quo is very powerful um, because failing by doing the status quo, quo doesn't really um, put you at risk. Mm, less, less open to criticism then. Yes, we will tolerate a lot of failure from sticking to the status quo, from sticking to what we're doing in a way that we won't tolerate failure from changing mm. what we normally do. Okay, yeah. so I, I, ta I remember talking to somebody who like, was thinking about quitting their job. And I asked them, they had another job in the offing and they came to me and they were like, can you help me decide whether I should quit? And I asked them about their job and it was basically, I'm paraphrasing, I hate it. I've hated it for five years. Nothing ever changes. Nothing is gonna change. It's the most terrible job ever. And I said, so now I'm just confused. <laughs> and I was like, okay, why don't you wanna switch? And she said, what if I hate the new job too? Hmm. That's how much, it, and you know that's happened to you. You've had that conversation, right? Why, why? So I said to her, well, what's the probability in a year you're gonna be happy in the job you're in? And she said, zero. And I said, what's the probability you'd be happy in the new job? And she said, I don't know, 50%. And I was like, it's 50% greater than zero. So notice she, yeah. what happens is that we get what's called, it's loss averse. And we get very loss averse on the innovative choice, on the non-consensus, the switch, that kind of thing, right? we get very lots of her. So for ourselves, we're so worried that it's not going to work out that we won't switch. And we tolerate the losses that are accruing by sticking to a path that we already know is not working. That is one of the reasons why we want, if we switch, we want to be able to say to people, I had no choice. Mm, I see. So that, so that if it doesn't work out when we go to something new, it, it doesn't feel quite as bad to us. Um, and I think that's like a big top thing that makes it really hard for us to switch. And it's what makes innovation so hard. So we can be thinking about, well, we really wanna be innovative, right? We, we super duper wanna be innovative. And so we start something, but the minute that we start an innovative project, it's very, very hard for us to stop that thing. Even when all signs point to, this isn't working, it's not gonna get to commercialization fast enough, it's not gonna actually make the world 10X better, like all the signs are there. We're going to be late to the switch because we. what if the new thing we go to doesn't work out, right? Like, what if that happens? And there's other things, and I'll, we'll, we can go through the bullets in a second. But so so what? we can be innovative on the start, but once we start something, we stop, we don't want to explore new things. We won't switch. We won't give up the thing that we already started because we're afraid of like, what if it doesn't work out? And then I'm going to feel bad. I'm going to feel like it's a mistake, but only on the switch. Yeah. Not on the stick. You know, actually that brought up one question I had. Um, having watched your your talk with Astro on this um personal exceptionalism. You know, I'm you know, things are nuanced enough. I, you know, I know things look bad, but I've got this ace up my sleeve, or I'm gonna be the exception, you know, and kind of to your point of like there's the mix of like, well, the deviating from the status quo, but you do run into individuals and especially here at X because we're doing a lot of groundbreaking work of sort of striking this balance between looking at the probability of, you know, expected value versus, well, we're in the business of moonshots and we have to 
we have to have a bias towards like where we can find exceptions because that's what we're looking for. We're trying to find the unique, the unique tech or the breakthrough solution that's going to enable us to go, to you know, go for the long mile. Um, but how do you, how do you keep, how do you not let the exceptionalism overpower the probability there with expected value for quitting? Yeah. So, look. So first of all. I, there's a there's a really big problem with survivorship bias, which is just that you hear about the successes. So one of the things I hear all the time is like, well, people shouldn't quit because of Dyson. The number of times people have mentioned Dyson to me, I, I wish I had a dollar <laughs> for every time they did it. I would be very rich. I don't know. He developed like 22 vacuums or something before. I, I don't know. Um, you know, or, or like another example would be um, Notion. So you know, Notion was down to its last 250, I think, was completely unable to raise around, was totally failing. And then um, Ivan went into a room in Japan or something and, you know, recoded the whole thing. And it happened to work, right? But I think that objectively we can say we don't want to do that, right? It's not a good plan in life to get down to your last 250, unable to raise a new round, right? Like that, yes, he did that, but that doesn't mean that that should be your plan. So let's just, just let's just start there. I, I think that's very important. We want to be very careful because we're very good at cherry picking, but that person did it. I saw something on Twitter once where when the when the market contraction occurred, uh, somebody was trying to encourage people. They said, um, it took us 16 months to raise our A, so don't ever give up. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's the worst advice I've ever heard. <laughs> like, that's terrible. Um, and the reason is that I don't care if it took you 16 months. That the, the advice is don't give up. It's don't give up if it's still worthwhile. And we have to remember this word worthwhile. All right, so how do we approach this? It turns out that when we approach these quitting problems um, really well, or starting and you know sticking or quitting problems really well, it helps us both to not abandon things that are worthwhile too soon, just because things got hard, but also to not stick to things too long uh, because, you know, we don't want to switch or because we don't want to give up what we've already put into it. So that would be the sunk cost bias, which I think is the number two thing that makes it really hard for us to quit, is that we, we take into account what we've already spent in deciding to whether to continue and spend more. So here's what we're trying to do. Whether we're talking about grit or, or quit, we're trying to align our behavior having started something to the way that we would behave if we had never started it in the first place. So we're pursue, we're trying to develop something. We have a project going. Um, we want our behavior to be the same in terms of would we start this knowing what we know now as it is would we continue this knowing what we know now. So we want those two, two things to align. Now, we know that people are sticking with things too long because all the data shows that those two things don't align and they align in a very particular way, which is that we stick to things that we would not start mm. given the information that we have today. Okay. And we know that that's the problem of most adults. That is not to say that grit, grit is not a worthwhile feature to develop in yourself. It certainly is. It helps you to stick to things when they're hard. It's particularly good for kids because kids are, are not particularly gritty. And we want them to be grittier. But every single person at X has, has too much grit. I guarantee it. I don't need to talk to any of you. I know you're all too gritty because um, I'm too gritty. I get it. Like we're all too gritty. That's why we're here, right? Okay. So, but the good news is that dealing with the too gritty problem helps you to also not quit too soon. So that's the good news. So we want to not quit too late and not quit too soon. And the way that we do that is by putting on a cadence two things. One, which you're very familiar with, which is monkeys and pedestals. It gets you focused on what is the actual bottleneck to us solving it um, and how are we going to attack that? And then you have to pair that, pair that. And don't build any unnecessary pedestals because then you accumulate sunk costs, which is really bad, right? Like, but I built all these pedestals. I can't quit, right? I put so much time and energy into those and I don't want to have wasted it. Okay. Well, you shouldn't have built those in the first place. So stop it. <laughs> um, but, uh, but then what we do is we pair monkeys and pedestals with really good kill criteria. So what we say is 
it's the equivalent of doing this. You, you sort of combine it with a pre-mortem. Imagine it's a, it's a year from now and this project has totally failed. Looking back, we realized there were early signals that that was going to happen. It was very clear. Looking back, we realized early on we, we, the signals were there. We knew that this was not going to succeed. What were they? I mean, it's, it's a simple exercise, right? So, um, you know, there's a lot of projects where you can say we're over budget and behind timeline from two years, right? Like, clearly, that's a really good signal that things aren't going your way. But there's just particular things that you have to solve. Like, so, for an example, like, let's say that you decided to pursue the Hyperloop and you knew that there was going to be a regulatory issue. Well, if you do, if you do monkeys and pedestals, you know, you have to address the regulatory issue. Right. And so now you attack that first before you build anything you have to go talk like, what's this route going to be? How are we going to deal with right of way and, you know, going through populous areas and track and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and then you have a list of kill criteria. We're going to go and test certain places and uh, ask them particular questions and see what, whether we could actually build this thing. And there's, you would just set up kill criteria around like, uh, if it goes this way, we'll continue. And if it goes this way, we're going to kill the project before we put a whole mm -hmm. lot into it. Um, and so that that's actually the way to do it because if you're meeting the benchmarks, it doesn't matter if it's hard, right? It's still what you've determined in advance that it's worth it's worth pursuing. Yeah, I'm assuming that you're not comparing it to other options. And then, but if you're not meeting those benchmarks, then you have a set of kill criteria which are, which are a set of either I'm killing it if I observe this. Or I'm seeking more information, and depending on that information, then I will kill it, right? So I may need to go find, if I see this, I need to find something else out, or I need to look for it. And then obviously that stuff morphs over time, right? Mm -hmm. So you might think about what are the monkeys in phase one, what are the kill criteria associated with those monkeys? Uh, and then as you start to solve for those things, now you redo the exercise. So you're consistently putting it on a new cadence. And that gets you to both stick to things long enough and also quit things soon enough or sooner than you otherwise would have. Yeah, no, that makes sense. The um, One of the examples that you brought up was uh, Stuart Butterfield, mm -hmm. uh, from Tiny Glitch to Flickr to Yahoo to what became Slack. And through multiple instances of him and you noted that he's a great example of someone who who quit early who was able to look at and salvage the the pieces that he had already made and spin that into something new um, and i know when you know when we talk about kill criteria it's the actualizing the entire loss and i'm i'm curious if if you've seen a lot where there's that if people can acknowledge or recognize, or if you have tips for how to do this, to recognize what it is that you've already built, such that it's not an, a complete loss, but hey, we've built up these other things and we're able to salvage or recoup the and spin that into something else. I wonder if that would be, if you've seen that as a trick or maybe that people can use to make the the idea of ending a project or killing anything not be so so hard yeah so there's there's two things in there one is the Stuart butterfield thing and the other is the question that you asked so let me start with the question that you asked and then kind of circle back to the Stuart butterfield thing um so when we start something uh we create a finish line so uh if i start a race if I start a marathon, um, there's now a finish line, uh, which is 26.2 miles. That is different than the finish line than if I start a half marathon, which would be 13.1 miles. Um, when we start a project, we have goals, right? So we're creating finish lines with those goals. When we buy a stock, we, we now have something that we're measuring against in terms of our mental accounting, right? If we're above if we're above uh, what we bought it at, we're what we would call in the gains. Uh, if we're below, we're in the losses and the, the finish line would be the break even point. Uh, and then that can change depending on if the stock goes up, we'll create a new finish line. Why am I bringing this up? So, because the, the way that we process um, 
where we are is in, in comparison to our distance from, from the finish line, not our distance from the starting point. So that's what you're referring to, right? So when, we, when we're doing a project, there's all sorts of things that we create along the way. But they don't count for anything because we haven't reached the finish line. So, so we only judge ourselves as short of the finish line. So you could you can you can imagine this pretty easily, right? If you run 24 miles of a marathon, you will feel like a failure. Even though you run 24 miles. That's 24 miles more than zero. That's a lot. But interestingly, if you were running a half marathon, you would have stopped at 13.2 miles anyway. Like you wouldn't just run the 24 miles because we're always measuring ourselves in comparison to the finish line. So what we want to start doing is thinking about ourselves as progress from the starting point. So you have to reframe. So you have to just say, what's our progress from the starting point as opposed to, uh, oh, we're short of our goal. Um, and that's where, that's where that can be incredibly helpful um, in terms of recovering technology. Now, you can also reverse engineer that and say, if we're going to start a project, then we ought to prefer projects that have things that are that we're where we will get things that are useful along the way. So um, either technologies that might be useful and be able to be repurposed, or we're going to learn a lot about what types of projects we might prefer, or what might end up being successful along the way. Um, so uh, you should have not have a preference for something that's all or nothing. So this would be. Um, something that would be a tiebreaker. Now, obviously there might be an all or nothing project that has a, just a much higher expected value. Go and do that. Just understand that there, you know, you may not recover something out of the way, but if you have two, if you're trying to decide where to put your resources between two things and they feel sort of like close to each other, um, am I, is there going to be stuff that I'm going to get along the way that's going to be useful regardless of whether I succeed or fail should, should be a very strong tiebreaker there. Now, I just want to circle back to Stuart Butterfield for a second because there's a really important lesson in here. When Stuart, so just for background, Stuart Butterfield was uh, creating a game called Glitch, which was a big, massive multiplayer online role playing game, and um, I had $6 million in the bank from Excel, uh, Andreessen Horowitz, some other big VCs. Um, so lots of money in the bank and 5,000 really diehard users. And uh, but he did not feel it was going particularly well because um, you needed 100 eyeballs to get like one sticky user. Uh, and he just thought like CAC was pretty bad in that case. And maybe maybe it wasn't going to be so good. So they did this big marketing campaign over six weeks and um, they actually grew uh, daily active users um, week over week by six percent. which So everybody thought it was a huge success and they ought to keep going. But a day after that marketing campaign closed he wrote a letter to his co-founders and investors saying, I woke up this morning with the dead certainty that glitch was over. All right. So what was he seeing? This has to do with this idea of like, well, how would you set kill criteria? Right. And um, for him, it had to do with like, is this a venture scale business? And he realized that if you continue to grow customers at the rate that they were, that it would be 31 months before they were break even. And it was an impossible assumption that you could continue to grow at that rate because obviously you're going to saturate the core gaming market and CAC is going to go up and uh, you're going to start getting to people who don't really care or to people who've already seen your ads. So that's that's why he shut it down, much to the surprise of everybody. Now you mentioned, oh, but it was really good because um, you know he he had stuff that he could use anyway, which was this internal messaging tool that ends up becoming Slack. The reason why I wanted to circle back to that is that he didn't know that. So they had had Slack and they had been using Slack or what was the pro, you know, the sort of uh, primitive version of Slack um, for, for a couple of years in the company internally. It was just an internal communication tool. He quit two days later was when he said, hmm, people like this internal communication tool. Like, maybe that could be something that we could actually develop. Mm. And then, he, you know, the investors rolled their money back over into Slack and we know what happened, right? Uh, I can't remember what it got sold to Salesforce for, but it was a lot of money. Um, so, so the lesson there is that, and I, I alluded to this earlier, is that be careful about what you start and be careful about how, like really be careful about sticking to things too long, particularly in the face of signals that you ought not to, 
Because when we once we started something, once we're in it, we are not good at seeing other things, even when they're right under our nose. So we're not good at seeing other opportunities that are even like far afield from us. I certainly never saw poker as an opportunity when I was doing graduate school. Stuart Butterfield didn't see the thing that everybody was using every single day and that the employees loved. He didn't think about it as a business. He never thought about developing it or selling it. He had to fully quit. He had to say, this is the end. I am shutting it down for him to be able to see the other opportunity. So we mm -hmm. have to remember that that's a, that's a hidden cost of the stuff that we're sticking to. So you need to be sure that the stuff that you're sticking to is worth it. It's going to get you to your goal because it's preventing you, every one of you brilliant people, from doing other things that you could put your brilliance to that might end up being slack. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, and I like that, I like that lesson that it just that you you won't really realize it until you kind of have you're forced now to sort of look at the other opportunities that are available. Right. right. Um, we've got a few questions here, and I know we're running short on time. Um uh, Emmy, go ahead and ask your question. I'll, I'll jump over to our Dory. Yeah, Annie, thank you so much. Um, really quickly, it seems like when people take the kind of lens of looking at things through bets, it can very quickly become zero sum. And I was wondering what your advice is on navigating um, sort of away from zero sum thinking to be able to see a lot of those broader options that you're talking about when looking at things through the context of bets. Um, yeah. Because I find that's often the case. Yeah. So if we really understand what what betting is, um, so I, people think about betting as like, I, I think the problem is, to your point, that people actually don't understand what a bet is. So uh, they think about it as I'm betting against another person where I win, you lose, you you win, I lose in equal amounts. Right. So that's zero sum. But what a bet is, is actually investing uh, resources in a particular option based on your belief based on your beliefs right so your beliefs are informing what options you choose and what wh where you choose to invest your time attention effort money and then this is the important part according to what your goals and values are so what we're always trying to do is pick options that cause us to either gain the most ground toward goals that we have or in some cases you have to choose the worst of many you know the best of bad options and so you might be choosing one that will cause you to to gain uh, to lose the least ground but in general we're trying to get ourselves moving toward a goal as best as we possibly can given whatever values you have and that's where betting becomes sometimes zero sum but actually most of the time it's positive sum because i have to make bets for example on on you know, for my children, like what school do I want to go them go to? What neighborhood do I want to live them? I'm making when I'm making bets about my life, I'm taking into account my kids, I'm taking into account my spouse, that kind of thing. When I'm working with clients, I'm trying to help them win. And then I win because that that's now part of my value set is that I want them to win. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, ways in which I go coach people on negotiations where it's good for both of you to win in the negotiation. And so it all has to do with what your values are. If we're measuring it by money and my value is to maximize my amount of money, no matter what, then it becomes zero sum because I'm going to maximizing my money is going to mean that I'm taking money from you. But most of the bets that we're making are actually going to be positive sum in our lives. lives. And that has to do with really clearly understanding what your goals are and what the values are that are informed, you know, that you're willing to go and try to reach that goal, you know, in terms of adhering to. Awesome. Thank you, Annie. Um, I know we're at time. If uh, if you've got a, a minute here, yeah. you've got one of the questions in the Dory, I think um, I'd be really curious to get your input on. Um, so a question came for a lot of projects at X have a potentially very heavy tailed distribution of outcomes. Mm -hmm. How do you think about quitting for an individual versus an institution that's holding a portfolio of projects? Are there heuristic equivalents for individuals for building anti-correlated portfolios of choices? That's a really good question. So um, let me think about it. So so let's start with the portfolio holder. Um, so 
with, so I, I work, I'm a special partner at First Round Capital Partners, their seed stage. We're talking about very fat tails, tail distribution, right? Uh, almost every company fails, but some are amazing. Um, so, you know, obviously we're trying to build a, a really strong and diverse portfolio, which will capture enough winners in there to, to end up being positive expected value. Um, and then what we do is we actually do a lot of monkeys and pedestals and kill criteria and that kind of thing to try to figure out where once it's in the portfolio, you would then concentrate your capital. So you're adding things to the portfolio, but you're actually purposely saying there's a bunch of stuff in here that I'm not I'm I'm putting in the portfolio, but then I'm not really going to do much with it after that. Right. And then we're we're trying to identify the things that look like they're reaching escape velocity. Okay, so so then the question is like, okay, so how do we do that for ourselves as individuals? It's the exact same idea. You have to sample a lot of things and then be very clear about what it would mean for that thing to work and then start to concentrate your capital on the things that are working for you. So, and never stop adding things to your portfolio, right? So we wanna basically run that same thing, right? So, so when we add something to our portfolio, we want to say, how much time and effort should I put into this? What are the questions that I should ask that are going to get me an answer the fastest about whether this is something that I ought to con continue to pursue? And then having decided that you should pursue it, then you would concentrate more of your treasure, time, attention, whatever, into, in, into that thing. So you can do that pretty purposefully yourself. So I'll, I'll just give you an example from my own life. Having had the, the, having had the forced quitting event in my life, um, I started playing poker, but then I got asked to start giving talks and I was thinking about how to intersect cognitive psychology with poker in a very explicit way. Um, and so I started doing that, but I didn't quit poker. I kept doing them at the exact same time. Um, and then I started, I, I had been a teacher and I thought, hmm, you know, I kind of like that. Maybe I want to go back to that. So now I was giving talks, which was a form of te teaching, but then I also started teaching poker. And then I was like, you know, I was a writer too. So I wrote some poker books. Um, and then people started asking me to consult and I'm literally doing this all at the same time. Mm. And then, then I start to concentrate, right? I say, you know what, actually to, to Emmy's point, I don't really like the zero sum nature of poker anymore. So I'm going to take that out of my portfolio. It is not bringing me joy. I don't like taking money from people where they're not winning anything to the situation. Mm. And I'm going to start doing this other thing. And I start concentrating over there. Um, and then I'm like, I want to write books. Uh, I, you know, my poker books do pretty well. I want to write books about the stuff that I've been talking to businesses about. And then I also want to consult, you know, so I've always got a bunch of things going on and I'm doing more or less of them. But enough to sort of find out, is this something that's worthwhile? So, so that's really, we really want to approach our lives as investors because that's the point, right? Like we're investing in these different things that we can do and start and options that we can do. And we need to start treating that like an investment because we're investing in our own happiness and our own fulfillment. And no investor would put all their eggs in one basket. Nobody. So start be behaving like an early stage venture capitalist when you're thinking about your own life. And mm -hmm. then those options are going to move through later stages as you're going to sort of develop those options more and you're going to get more information. And then you can start deciding, I'm going to take this out or I'm going to concentrate more capital here. But then always be looking for new things to get into your portfolio that you get to sample. Yeah, I really like that idea for us all being investors for our own time and attention and energy and finances and um, helps you make better decisions. Yes. <laughs> it, it that way. Um, well, I know we're, we're over time. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming today and especially uh, to Annie, thank you for joining us. This has been an amazing conversation and I really appreciate all of your insight and your work and um, it's all very inspiring and very educational as well for how to make better decisions. Um, in our well, lives. Thank so, you so much for having me again. I love coming and talking to this group. 